Wildfire smoke clouding the skies. There are now 107 large fires blazing that have burned more than 2 million acres in 14 states. Vehicle emissions hovering over highways. Experts have identified diesel cars as being partly responsible for the worsening air quality and increasing level of fine dust in this country. Factories burning fossil fuels day after day. An invisible killer on the loose, responsible for millions of deaths. Air pollution is all around us. Air pollution is a huge public health threat globally, and we don't really treat it that way, at least not relative to the size of the problem. And the devastating impact of that problem is far bigger than most people realize. It outstrips HIV AIDS, TB, malaria, road injuries, war, and even smoking when it comes to the size of the public health threat. That's Krista Hazenkope director of the Air Quality Life Index at the University of Chicago's Energy Policy Institute, or EPIC. It's definitely a very serious problem, and it's got sort of these invisible costs that are going to hold back development in all sorts of ways. And that's Anat Sudarshan, the South Asia director of the Energy Policy Institute. And so there is a, a communication issue in trying to get people to see the cost of pollution. We might not always be able to see just how dirty the air around us is, but it's costing us years off of our lives. We lose, on average, about two years of our lives globally due to poor air pollution. But it's not just that we're also paying the financial costs for our dirty air. The global economy loses more than $8 trillion annually. That, that's about 6% of global GDP to air pollution. From the University of Chicago Podcast Network, this is Big Brains, a podcast about the pioneering research and the pivotal breakthroughs that are reshaping our world. On this episode, where air pollution is getting worse around the world and how we can ensure that everyone has access to clean and healthy air. When you visualize air pollution, you might think of the great smog of London in the 1950s, the soot in the sky during the Industrial Revolution. I think we've all either seen pictures or, or um, heard stories or read Charles Dickens where there's you know, a blanket of, of smoke in the sky. But just because we can't see visible clouds of pollution in the air doesn't mean it isn't affecting us. I think it can be very easy to ignore air pollution. It's invisible when it's harming us. We don't die from air pollution disease, but rather like the issues that are come from downstream of it. But people learn to ignore it, um, and that's part of uh, the problem. One of the ways that Hazenkope and the team at Epic have been getting people to pay more attention to this crisis, despite its often invisible nature, is with an annual public report called the Air Quality Life Index. So that report is a yearly report where we capture the health impact of uh, air pollution for that year's air quality across the globe on, on the length of a human, human life. And this year's report was not reassuring. The new study out of the University of Chicago says air pollution takes more than two years off of the average human's lifespan. That's more than causes like smoking, communicable disease, and war. But in some parts of the world, tragically, that number is much higher. So in our report, you can see that there's a very large impact in South Asia, for example. So in India, there's an average life expectancy loss of about five years. Anyone venturing outdoors in the Indian capital Delhi today is taking a risk. Air quality charts state if they stay outside for too long, they could contract a respiratory illness. In Bangladesh, almost seven years. Bangladesh has one of the world's fastest growing economies. But its rapid urban development and heavy construction in the densely packed capital Dhaka has come at a cost. Pollution. In, in Pakistan, almost four years. Pakistan's Lahore city has been declared the most polluted in the world by an air quality monitor as citizens continue to breathe in toxic smog. And Sudarshan can tell you firsthand what it's like to live with this problem in India. Let's say you were coming from uh, a place like Chicago with relatively clean air. And as soon as you step off the airplane, you're going to feel like you're breathing in a little bit of smoke. Your throat is going to get irritated. Your eyes might be watering. You also see it in things like, you know, uh, if you run the Delhi half marathon, for example, it's probably really bad for you. And a lot of people finish that race legitimately ill. Like they will, they will have flu symptoms at the end of that because they've spent a significant amount of time exerting themselves in poor air. 
For years, medical experts have warned about the impacts of dirty air on older people and immunocompromised people. But now we're learning about the impact on babies and kids. A recent report that looked at infant mortality found that about a half a million babies die each year in the first month of life due to air pollution as well. So so these life expectancies are averages. It, it represents um, many forms of loss from air pollution. I mean, there was recently a study which a prominent public health NGO did in the capital city of Delhi, where they found about 30% of school children had uh, asthma and airflow problems. And so that's just an astonishingly high number. And that's directly coming from the quality of the air they breathe. It's obviously even worse uh, for infants exposed to those, um, those levels of pollution. Dust, soot, smoke, pollen, even indoor air pollution. These particles are omnipresent. Particulate matter is just stuff floating in the air. It could be a liquid droplet, it could be a solid droplet. The issue comes about with the size of the particles. So, you know, stuff like most dust or pollen doesn't doesn't really cause too much health harm unless you have allergies because your body can protect itself. When you breathe it in, your throat it catches in your throat, it comes uh, your nose catches it. The problem happens when the particles are small. And one of the most worrying types of particulate matter is called... When we say PM2.5, that's particles that are two and a half microns in diameter. And if you're wondering just how small 2.5 micrometers is, think about a single hair on your head. 20 of those can fit across a, a hair, a piece of human hair. Um, so they're pretty tiny and they can invade really far into not just your lungs, but actually into your, your circulation and affect your heart and affect your brain, pretty much every major organ in your body. And, and and so if I'm breathing these things in, what kind of an impact is it actually having inside my body? So we often think of air pollution as causing respiratory issues, which it does. It causes uh, lung issues. Uh, it can cause asthma attacks. But some of the most serious consequences of air pollution is that it can cause cardiac arrest. It can cause a heart attack. It's been linked with even cognitive issues like Alzheimer's. There's a wide array of, of issues that air pollution can, can cause in the body. One recent study in the UK found that if you were to live in an area with high levels of fine particulate matter for just one year, it would be the equivalent of smoking 150 cigarettes. Smoking cigarettes causes about a 1.9 year uh, life expectancy loss, whereas PM2.5 pollution causes about 2.2. Year. So they're they're comparable. Particles less than 2.5 micrometers pose the greatest risk to our health. But even if you manage to avoid the worst of these particles, you're not in the clear. Last year, the World Health Organization updated its air quality guidelines to include air pollutants that are actually greater than PM 2.5. So previously, the annual value that was considered safe to be exposed to for PM 2.5 was 10 micrograms per cubic meter. They changed that to half that, to five micrograms per cubic meter. In the US, our standard is 12 micrograms per cubic meter. And so half that is is quite ambitious. And, and to put it in context in another way, this means that about 99% of the world's population is breathing unhealthy air as classified by these, these guidelines. So they're quite ambitious. At this point, you're probably thinking of the highway across the street or the factory up the road and wondering, where does all this particulate matter come from? Well, the main culprit won't be surprising. Uh, the majority of air pollution's health impact is coming from burning fossil fuels. In fact, according to one recent study, if the United States stopped burning fossil fuels, we could prevent an estimated 50,000 premature deaths due to air pollution. I'd say the, the big picture is that most of uh, the PM2.5 that poses a risk to human health is coming from burning of stuff. What often makes this problem so difficult is that in many parts of the world, there just isn't one easy culprit. Part of it is traffic and industry, both of which are sort of badly regulated. And part of it is, uh, is you know, people burning biomass because often they're using that for cooking. So it's a whole bunch of things. You know, in a city, you might have waste burning outside because you don't have uh, good systems to collect and, and dispose of, of waste. So it's a mix of different causes, which also makes it more difficult to build consensus because 
you know, any one lobby or any one source can credibly say, well, the problem isn't just us. And, and so you almost need a big push on many dimensions, and that makes it challenging to solve. Okay. But it's not consistent, right? You could, you could go from neighborhood to neighborhood or country to country or state to state and find that the impact of air pollution is different in different places, isn't it? Absolutely. It's it, air pollution and your exposure to it can be super hyper local. Um, it, you know, it depends if you live near a highway, if you are near, um, a coal burning fire plant. If you're in a busy, uh, highly busy trafficked area, uh, you're going to have hot spots of NO2, of nitrogen dioxide, um, from, from cars. Um, in a more fine grain way, a PM 2.5, a component of PM 2.5 also can contribute to directly to, to climate change as well. Solutions around climate change have huge overlap with solutions around cleaning up the air too. Now you talked about this in terms of burning of fossil fuels. And, and I think we saw that even during the first year of the pandemic, there was less consumption of fossil fuels. Is that accurate? And has it continued? I was so curious what the end result, like if you looked at the, the total uh, pollution levels for 2020, what this would end up looking like. And so we look at that in our report and we see just the, the tiniest decrease from 2019 to 2020 globally. I thought that was pretty surprising. During that period, uh, while there were lockdowns, there was also another part of the year where uh, we were trying to overcompensate for that lack of production. And in some places, government restrictions around air quality were eased so that production could be increased to, to compensate for that. So that could be play part of why, why that's the case. According to the new Air Quality Life Index report, air pollution continued to increase in South Asia during the first year of the pandemic. It's clear that air pollution has a disproportionate impact on lower income communities around the globe. But unfortunately, communities don't always have access to this data about their air quality. That's where Krista says we need to bridge the gap. It is hard to find data in a lot of the hyperlocal situations where air quality can be the worst in, in the U.S. There's not necessarily monitoring um, in, in those locations. It tends to be more spread out from the EPA. And so there's a bit of a, a data gap. Even if you live in a highly polluted place, at, say a hot spot, it might not be on the radar for, for getting cleaned up. For instance, California is exploring, uh, they have this AB 617 legislation that is helping communities, um, not only supporting them to put up monitoring themselves, but to also integrate that into their, California's uh, emission reporting and monitoring in a more formal manner. So I'd love to see that skilled. Um, you know, for $10 million, you could fill a lot of gaps across the world, major countrywide gaps in air quality data across the world. The solutions to solving our air pollution problem are not that difficult in practice. In fact, one region in India is proving that it's possible. Their solution and how it could be scaled worldwide after the break. When it comes to reducing air pollution, it's actually not as hard as tackling something big, like climate change. In fact, Sudarshan has been working on what could be a new system for fighting air pollution. India's first clean air market. It's a trading market, so you set a limit on the total amount of pollution that can be produced by a population of sources, but you let them trade permits so that they can distribute among themselves who's going to do most of the emission cutting and who's going to do less. And this makes it much cheaper for the small companies and the manufacturers to cut pollution without having to bear the burden of those costs all on their own. If it's really expensive for you to cut pollution, uh, maybe because you're a small plant or, or there's something idiosyncratic about your technology, then you can buy permits from someone else, which in effect is paying them to do more reduction themselves. And so that makes it cheaper and that's relevant, especially in an Indian context. I mean, you always want environmental regulation to be cheap and efficient, but in a developing country where there's this concern about a you know possible trade-off between environment and economic growth it becomes all the more important to to be able to cut pollution without imposing large costs on industry in 2019 the team at epic launched the idea in india's gujarat state in a city called surat surat is a is a dense industrial city it's not you know the most polluted place in in india 
but a large part of the pollution is coming from industrial emissions because it's a manufacturing cluster for the textile industry in particular which is also a significant source of pollution because all of these plants are burning coal uh, many of them are relatively small industries and you know do not have necessarily the ability to spend very large amounts of money on environmental abatement you know the surat ets was set up as a randomized control trial which means we are in a position to very accurately measure what it actually did in this case it was really run almost like a large scale medical trial where we had mm. um you know about 150 factories in the initial phase of the market in a treatment group where they could be uh could trade permits and be in the market and another 150 chosen at random within the same city that were regulated using the status quo so you have very high quality evidence comparing like to like of what the two forms of you know environmental regulation achieve you know the project is still ongoing but we now have early results and we think that emissions from the industries that were in the market have been cut by about 20 to 30% uh, we see okay. no evidence of an increase in costs uh, and the scheme is popular so we've actually had uh, industries uh, asking to be enrolled in the market um, you know factories in surat but also uh, the the program is now being scaled up across the state both because it's cut pollution but also because uh, industry actually prefers or at least uh, has has been willing to consider this new form of regulation i think that's a that's a political win if you see you know 30% reductions in pollution from an important source and that source is is not protesting about the about the policy but you know willing and asking to be part of it um and that's kind of why i think we've seen that scale up across gujarat Gujarat's clean air market hasn't targeted 100% of particulate pollution, but if markets continue to scale up like this across the state, it could add years back onto people's lives. You know, we've not cleaned up India's air. That's not something that that is ever going to be achieved by one idea tackling one source of pollution. But I think uh what the larger picture that these clean air markets uh, prove is also the value of experimentation but you've also proved that you can run a market and that indian regulators can successfully execute this and industry can understand this and trades can be conducted on a secure platform and so once you've done it for one pollutant you can begin to ask you know what about doing it for others and co2 is 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 one and so the scale up that you are talking about one is on the dimension of more clean air markets and the other is on the dimension of different pollutants india isn't the only country using inventive measures to fight back against air pollution one of the countries that has seen the most progress is surprisingly china If we look at a say a longer term trend from 2013 to 2020, we do see about a, a 10% improvement across the globe for particulate pollution. But the thing is is that most of that progress actually that entire progress can be captured by China. To understand how China tackled its smoggy problem, we have to go back all the way to January 2013 when Beijing experienced what became notoriously known as the air apocalypse. Beijing's air quality has worsened dramatically in recent years. The first half of the year saw only 2 days in 5 with air deemed healthy. The air got so bad that uh it was a very visible problem. Soupy skies enveloped the city with a shroud of vehicle exhaust and factory emissions. And this was also around the time when folks were starting to get smartphones and had apps and were getting real-time information about the air quality and so they weren't just seeing it this had happened before but they were they were seeing it quantified in front of them and seeing this is this is unhealthy air for you to be breathing and that spurred a ton of media attention and public push for for clean air around that time period the smog took on a name the air apocalypse for the first time there was access to open data that then 
app developers scraped from various sites and put on apps that millions of Beijingers saw. This stimulated all kinds of reaction from the media, including a journalist who ended up doing a landmark documentary on the impact of air pollution on her life and her child's life uh, that had a huge impact too. And so it had all these knock-on effects and really kept the momentum going and pushed the government. So in 2014, they declared a war on pollution. The war against the pollution is bidding wage across China. In North China's Hebei province, polluting iron and steel and the cement factories are being torn down, notwithstanding many of them being pillars of local economy. Um, this included policy changes, but also infrastructure to enforce policy changes, as well as huge increase in the number of, of monitoring stations across the country uh, to actually measure that progress as well. China's 2013 action plan set ambitious goals to reduce air pollution, including capping the share of coal in the energy mix at 65 percent and reducing PM 2.5 emissions by 25 percent in Beijing, Hebei and Tianjin. And so year on year, they've we've seen a, a trend where there's been improvement and, and as I mentioned earlier there's been about a 40 percent reduction since since 2013 which is something that in the U.S. took decades to achieve. I guess in, in some ways should we be a little bit more encouraged because there are places i.e. China that took this seriously and are seeing the benefits of it? I truly think the reason that China uh, has been so successful is because there was such a large and sustained public outcry about air pollution. So I think the public's engagement in air pollution made it a made it an issue that that couldn't be ignored. One major difference between Sadarshan's project and what happened in China is that the Chinese government relied heavily on top-down command and control measures, whereas he used market forces to drive down air pollution. And he argues that markets may be the better way to solve this problem, especially in countries that rely on industries for development. It's also the case that when you don't have environmental regulation working, which is the status quo, you're at risk of these extreme measures that could be implemented because say someone goes to the courts, for example, and says, look, yeah. there are all these plants, they're emitting too much, the law says they need to be shut down, you know, shut them down. And there have been cases in India where the courts have then made draconian rulings where, you know, for example, in the capital city of Delhi, they just said all of these industries need to shut down and they need to move out of the city, right? And so those things are too few and far between uh, to stop pollution from becoming a problem, but they're a big enough risk for industry that you'd rather have regulation that's low cost but predictable than regulation which you can ignore maybe, but which is sort of open to potentially corruption and open to these super strong kind of crackdowns that happen in unpredictable ways. And so that's a measure of costs, which is not necessarily dollars and cents um, that you spend every year, but more a kind of cost of doing business um, in a predictable environment. And market schemes for reducing air pollution have been tried elsewhere. So there's never been a market uh, tackling particulate emissions, but the United States did run a market that's been credited with a lot of success, which was the acid rain scheme, which was targeted at a different pollutant, sulfur dioxide. One of the interesting things that has happened is that Gujarat is now announced that they plan to introduce India's first carbon market. Now that doesn't have to do with clean air, but a carbon trading scheme is something that the United States, for example, has not been able to do nationwide. Uh, California does have one. And it's come because part of the outcome is did you clean up the air and reduce pollution? And that's the main goal of the market as well. But you've also proved that you can run a market. We know the solutions for air pollution. They're not rocket science. We've seen them implemented successfully in places like China, in the U.S., in large parts of Europe. Uh, so I think we know the ingredients to success in a lot of different contexts. Um, it's really just building up the local political will uh, to, to do that. In addition to political will, we also need the funding. Historically, air pollution hasn't been super high on the radar or had its own dedicated bucket of funding. For example, about 0.1% of global philanthropic giving is devoted to clean air. Uh, that's about $40 million. And I once read a, a stat that Americans lose more than that in misplaced pocket change each year. 
Uh, and so, so it's very disproportionate relative to the, the harm it's causing us. Although more and more philanthropies are donating to fight the climate crisis, there isn't nearly enough money going to fight air pollution. The, most of that money, most of the, the organizations giving that money are coming from energy, climate, uh, and environment organizations, not public health. So there's a, a big gap. But I think one of the larger issues is that uh, we need to find ways to, to make it air pollution visible as a public health issue and to get the public health community around that. And, you know, I think academic uh, public health community is already on board. They're, they're calling the alarm, but really to get the philanthropy and international development community uh, engaged on, on air pollution is, is, the real, is the real challenge. But one of the things that you know, our research group and that, you know, people in New Chicago and EPIC are doing is saying, okay, what have we actually proved? We've actually proved that if regulation isn't working, you need to try out new things. There's a systematic way of trying them out. Now, can we think of bright ideas for transport, for instance? Can we think of uh, bright ideas for dealing with um, the burning of crops, um, which is a big source of pollution in winter? And, and so that's Another dimension in which I think this program has kind of shown how researchers and policymakers can work together um, and do so in a systematic way that moves the needle on very intractable problems that you've sort of spent decades trying and failing to solve.